Good morning and welcome to the Coinbase Institutional Markets Call. My name is Greg Sutton. I'll be your host today, standing in for Ben Floyd, who is uh, hopefully in a very nice locale in Europe. Uh, it's August 1st, around 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We have a great lineup today. George is going to provide us with a market update. On the surface, price action has been quiet, but there's been a lot of interesting events going on. He's going to take us through them. Sid is back just in time to help us understand this curve exploit. Uh, I'm hoping he can help me understand what a re-entrancy attack is and if I need to be worried about it. And then David is going to cover the macro backdrop for us. We've recently heard from a number of central banks. The Bank of Japan is on the cusp, maybe, of a serious change in stance. Uh, so what does this all mean for markets and especially crypto markets? And then lastly, Trish is going to take us through flows, what he's seeing on the desk, and just general client sentiment. Before we get started, um, if you're watching on video, there's a QR code there. We mention this every time. Uh, that will take you to Coinbase Research and all of the great work that David and his team does. Uh, I know it's where I learn the most about crypto. If you don't see that QR code, just go to coinbase.com forward slash institutional and click on research and insights. Regardless of whether you're watching on a uh, video or listening on podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast platform is. Tell your friends to subscribe too. Uh, you know, everybody should know about crypto. It's the future. So with that, I think it's time to get started. Uh, George, what's going on out in the markets today? Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, so looking at the price section over the last week, uh, we really spent most of the time consolidating in the majors. Uh, but that's not to say that there wasn't anything interesting happening in altcoins. Um, the market has been in a very tight sideways range for most part. Um, and BTC um, was really just trading around $29,000 uh, ETH, uh, just under eighteen fifty. dollars um and similarly no big changes in the eth btc um or eth plus btc rather uh, dominance over the last uh, two weeks uh, we're down ever so slightly um so relatively speaking slightly more interest in altcoins vis-a-vis uh, -vis the majors um but in particular if you look at that uh it was um some of the DeFi 1.0 og coins that have been doing uh pretty well uh, so you have uni for instance and maker um as some examples uh, they were up around 12 percent uh, each uh maker we covered it in last week's call introduced the burn mechanism and um some on-chain data was suggesting that you have uh, per you had purchases from wales and uni was also doing quite well with a lot of talk um on in social media about uh, before coming and actually um, according to token terminal it almost generated about 310 million dollars in fees over the last 180 days uh, so doing quite well there great and then um so curve was obviously a big event um what can you tell us uh, about that um what kind of price action did we see in the market was there any uh you know reaction outside of the the curve token itself yeah so um there's definitely been a few interesting stories um so curve obviously the the big one um has been underperforming over the last seven days it's down around 20 percent um after it got exploited but i think um you know obviously we'll hear more details on on what happened exactly from uh sid and david later but a real problem from my view for curve is not really the hack itself um it looks more like the bigger problem here is um, the loans that the Curve founder took out. So roughly a hundred million dollars across Avi and, and Frax as well. Um, so there is definitely some stop hunting uh, going on uh, in the market and a couple of liquidation levels to watch out for are um, around 38 and uh, 38 to 40 um, cents uh, on uh, Curve. Now, the interesting thing, actually, I quickly want, also wanted to mention is uh, BASE. Um, so that's the L2 launched by Coinbase that has been live since mid-July uh, for builders. And it's definitely started to see some traction um, as well um, over the last week or so um, with the total value bridged over to BASE, um, now running at over $80 million and uh, the full launch uh, expected um, in, in the coming weeks. Yeah, great. We're, uh, yeah, that's great. We're all very excited uh, about base. Um, we have uh, 
you know, a number of uh, interesting things planned for, for the rest of the summer here. So that'll be really fun to get that going. Um, thanks, George. Let's bring Sid in and talk more about this curve situation. Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, I mean, Sid. Yeah, could you take us through kind of what happened? Um, you know, and, and I, like I said, would love to know what a re-entrancy attack is. Yeah, for sure. It, it was a pretty uh, substantial event that took place uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, so to start off with, you know, high level, what happened was, you know, there was an exploit on curves on several curve finance pools um, that, you know, drained um, um, what is now over almost $70 million um, cumulatively uh, in the ecosystem. And uh, the, the key cause of this seems to have sprung from the uh, an actual issue in the Viper programming language uh, for the smart contract itself. Uh, so just for context, Viper is one of the programming languages that uh, developers can use to uh, build smart contracts. The other uh, most prominent one, of course, is Solidity. Um, for context, you know, Solidity currently secures around 90% of DeFi TVL, while Viper is, you know, anywhere from 8 to 10%. So, you know, relatively smaller uh less used programming language and historically it had only a few core developers and it seems that this issue has sprung from a previous a few versions of viper where uh there weren't proper checks for what is called a re-entrancy attack um as you mentioned what is a new re-entrancy attack um it's basically when when uh, an, an attacker can call a function on a smart contract and then call another function before the first function uh, executes um therefore messing around with the smart contract's internal state uh, where it holds variables such as balances of assets and uh, other key variables uh, and, um, you know, manipulating the state to uh, cause an exploit. I mean, this is basically what happened here uh, with Curve. Um, so, you know, around $45 million was stolen from uh, from pools that involved assets from, you know, Alchemix, Metronome and JPEG, and then another $25 million from the Curve's own CRV ETH pool as well. Um, so, uh, you know, it's pretty, it caused quite a lot of ripple effects, uh, including on CRV itself. Uh, you know, uh, as you can see in the chart if for folks watching on the slides, um, the founder of Curve Protocol actually has a pretty large, substantial borrow position open on Aave uh, with over $100 million of collateral, CRV collateral. Um, and while we're still pretty far away from that position being liquidated, you can see uh, once it once it hits that, you know, in the 0.38 uh, range, um, it's a pretty substantial portion to be liquidated. And folks are watching the attacker now um, on chain because they have a they have you know around four 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 point five million dollars worth of CRV themselves, which they haven't sold. And the market liquidity for CRV currently on DEXs is pretty thin. So that's the current situation. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I guess to to carry out um, an exploit like this, you obviously need to be incredibly advanced. There was another player, if I recall, Coffee Babe. Um, what did what did she or he or, or they do, and, and how are they kind of involved in this? Yeah, this is pretty interesting. Um, this is actually uh, Coffee Babe .eth is the ENS name of um, uh, of an address that uh, basically front ran this attacker that was exploiting the curve pools uh, and managed to um, take back uh, around 2,800 ETH uh, or you know 5.4 million dollars worth of, of capital from the attack and they basically returned those funds to the curve team they acted as kind of a white hat exploiter and the way they were able to do this by uh, was by running an MEV bot um, so basically what MEV bots do is they try to front run or back run transactions on, on several DEXs on, on chain and uh, just execute the transaction faster than the actual um, exploiters transaction. So they paid more gas and they were able to execute it um, and they spotted the trade on chain and they executed it. So, uh, but yeah, ultimately it's, you know, it was, it was pretty cool to see that on chain, uh, but it's still a small percentage of the overall uh, exploited amount. Yeah, it's great to know that there are, uh, you know, some some good actors out there. Uh, let's bring David in. David recently put out a piece, I think this morning, um, you know, on the curve exploit and how it could affect the DeFi landscape and, and liquidity. Uh, David, love to get your take on, you know, all that's going on right now. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I would say that's the second big question here. So the first, obviously, being how did this happen? Second is 
does this have any major ramifications for DeFi? Does it have any systemic risks? Um, it's all pretty unclear at the moment, you know, and the most important part of this is that curve pools play a major part in the Ethereum CeFi stack. Uh, it's a major source of liquidity. Um, you know, what we're seeing right now is that actually uh, the price of ETH, for example, it's moving more or less in line with the rest of its crypto peers. Uh, that to us kind of suggests that the consensus believes uh, there's limited systemic risk uh, associated with this exploit. And I would say based on our current understanding, we generally agree with that sentiment. But as kind of Sid pointed out, there are two potential sources of systemic risk here. I do think there are mitigating factors that do help there. Like, for example, the, uh, the $70 million loan position that uh, Sid kind of talked about, you know, that seems pretty large, particularly since there's $115 million worth of curve kind of uh, uh, collateralizing that. But that still represents only around 2.2% of Aave's debt collateral. And... The other big concern is, of course, LPs have been withdrawing from curve pools. Not all of that uh, is, you know, voluntary. For example, some of that is, you know, curve actually telling some LPs to actually exit certain pools as a precaution. But overall, this isn't the first time we've seen this. Um, just over the last year alone, we've seen some LPs kind of pulling out of pools for various reasons. The last time we saw this was uh, after the FTX collapse, for example, which strained the TVL by around like 38%. But eventually, within about two months, we did see a lot of those funds return. So I think that's something to look forward to uh, when we're thinking about this. Yeah, Curve's obviously a huge part of the DeFi landscape. Uh, Sid, question, is this Viper language used in any of the, the very large stablecoin pools, do you know? So, uh, you know, so for instance, the uh, you know, USDC, USDT pool, or, um, you know, some of those that... Uh, we often see so much volume go through. Yeah, um, so it is actually, it's used in several uh, version, several of the pools for Curve, but uh, just the version, the actually the what, what matters here is the version of the Viper language. So this was, the exploit was, was uh, uh, you know, exploited on, on a previous versions of the language, which didn't, uh, uh, you know, check for these reentrancy attacks. So latest versions do, and it's been patched but it's kind of up to developers to upgrade their contracts to the latest version so that they remain safe. So uh, this is not just for Curve, but also systemically across the ecosystem. You know, several development teams have curve, uh, have forked Curve, um, Ellipsis, Phi, you know, other tri-crypto pools on Arbitrum, on Binance Smart Chain, et cetera. So um, it's up to these teams to kind of update and, and uh, stay, out, stay on top of it. Well, I imagine they're all uh, busy doing that right now. Um, well, Sid, thanks for uh, you know taking us through that. Um, this is uh, very helpful. David, a lot going on in macro. We've heard from a, a number of central banks recently. Um, love to get your take. Sure, uh, I would say like the big part of this has to do with dollar strength. You know, it keeps trending higher, and it's kind of tough to kind of parse this because of everything that's gone on with the central banks last week. It was obviously a pretty busy, busy, crazy week. Um, you know, on the one hand, you know, like a stronger dollar represents the acceleration of a disinflationary trend, which if it continues means, you know, a Fed rate cut could actually happen sooner rather than later. Uh, and that helps risk assets. On the other hand, uh, for the time being, a stronger dollar dampens the appeal of digital assets because, you know, a lot of these tokens are often valued against the dollar. So I think the game right now, uh, that, or at least the name of the game, excuse me, is divergent because in the U.S., you know, the economic data has you know, all things considered, been pretty good. Um, and inflation is clearly coming down. Uh, whereas in Europe, the data has been pretty tough, challenging, maybe you could say bad. Uh, and inflation has been trending the right way, but it's still been very sticky, like food prices, energy, you know, they, they're all affected by the war in Ukraine. China growth is disappointed. Uh, Japan, they're pivoting away from yield curve control. So, you know, I think a big part of this has been the fiscal spending in the U.S. So that's been uh, very supportive of growth. Um, and for the time being, it seems that stocks love this dynamic. No big surprise there. Um, but, you know, if you've been listening to this call over the last few weeks, uh, you know that I switched from more of a bullish view to more of a defensive view in the short term. And some people might think that seems kind of nuts because everyone else is super bold up at the moment. But just my view is purely based on positioning and the fact that a lot of that bullishness that I was kind of anticipating has now kind of already happened. Um, so 
doesn't mean that I'm not constructive by the time we get into Q4, but for the time being, I'm just being cautious. Um, any case, strong dollar. I think that should continue in the short term. Positive seasonals backing that. That happens in August. Plus, you get these interest rate differentials. Fed's hawkish tone versus the dovishness in other central banks. Um, plus, you know, keep in mind, we've got payrolls this Friday. That's great. Thank you. Now, we've obviously had low correlations between crypto and traditional assets, um, you know, recently. Uh, and completely agree that positioning in, you know, equities, for instance, does look uh, stretched. If we did see traditional risk assets sell off, would you expect that to kind of take crypto with it? Or would you expect those low correlations to hold in our markets to continue to kind of trade on their own? Yeah, this has been a very interesting development, uh, especially coming off of last year. And, you know, we kind of forget that historically speaking, actually, assets like Bitcoin have actually had a very low, if not negligible correlation to other assets like U.S. stocks, S&P 500 or the NASDAQ. But last year was actually the exception. Um, what we're seeing right now is actually uh, Bitcoin and the S&P, for example, have almost no relationship. Um, ETH, it's slightly higher, but even there, even though the coefficient is closer to like 0.2, it's still kind of suggesting that the relationship at least is, is very low. Now, I think that particularly decoupling at this point in time, given the fact that stocks are moving up, might actually be somewhat disappointing for some folks because, you know, crypto has been so flat and you're seeing like all these other stocks kind of moving higher. I don't actually think that's a bad thing. You know, I think that uh, if anything, it kind of suggests that we're not seeing the same speculative excess that we've seen in past cycles. Uh, and the volatility, you know, it's actually made it harder last year for a lot of uh, institutional investors to justify including these assets in the portfolios. That overhang doesn't really exist right now because as it stands, uh, Bitcoin actually, because it has no correlation to those other assets, plus it has this strong risk adjusted return profile, uh, you know, volatility has been low, you know, it suggests that this is actually be additive to traditional portfolios from that risk diversification standpoint. So I don't think it actually behooves me in any way to actually see more discipline at play here. Yeah, anything we can uh, do to make you know crypto a, a more valuable part of a diversified portfolio, uh, I'm certainly for. So um, hopefully those low correlations continue because um, if we're not going to enjoy the upside, uh, I certainly don't want to get dragged along on the downside. Um, David, thanks uh, thanks for that update. Um, Trish, what is going on on the desk? Uh, what kind of flows are we seeing? Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me on this week. So, um, yeah, overall, it's been a very mixed couple of weeks on the desk, uh, to be frank. I mean, as uh, George mentioned earlier, there's been not much uh, in terms of price action on, on the likes of Bitcoin and ETH. Um, so generally, flows have been you know steady uh, and two-way on, on, on those two. Um, zooming out a little bit and looking at um, the rest of the universe, you know, um, we have seen some, some uh, standout um tokens there that have have kind of um seen some different flows so for example sol we've seen some um selling from vc vc um clients um both traditional and crypto native vcs that is um and then um some of the, the two that george mentioned maker and uni who've both had very strong weeks up 12 and a half percent or so um we've seen a demand for both of those um from, from again, the crypto native community. So, you know, flows have been a little bit mixed this week overall, um, but generally, you know, going, um, you know, it's still good to see some of those crypto natives active in some of those selective tokens um, in, in that kind of mid tier. Um, wanted to touch on like just overall exchange volumes on the, on the first, uh, next slide rather. Um, generally, um, you know, given it's a summer period, you know, Daily um, average daily volume has been trading around nine hundred million dollars on the Coinbase exchange. That's been make, make, made up of around thirty six and a half percent on Bitcoin, nineteen percent on ETH, thirteen percent on uh, Tether, and then Doge, Sol, and Ripple seeing five, four, and three percent of exchange market share respectively. So you know, again, this is this is in line with norm, a continuation of you know a summer period, bar some you know. Um, spikes here and there with, with certain events such as the Ripple 
case a few weeks ago and, and of course relisting by a lot of major exchanges. Um, um, looking at the next slide on um, buy and sell ratios amongst retail clients, I think this has been quite interesting here where you know we've, we've seen the purple line at the bottom, this is the ETH um, buy sell ratio and that's been hovering kind of over the last couple of weeks around 50 percent amongst retail clients which gives me kind of um, cements that view of no, no real conviction amongst the retail client base um, on those assets no surprise to see ripple and dogecoin the the respective kind of green and orange um, overall being very volatile but again being um, showing strong buy ratios you know these are two you know retail um tokens that they, they love to trade and then kind of middle of the pack slightly higher than um uh average kind of low 60s to mid 60s um both bitcoin and Sol. so again remaining very steady um, amongst the retail client base there on on those two um and then one one topic which has come up a lot in conversations with um, institutional clients has been liquidity now as we saw we saw volume spike um, post Ripple and um, ETF headlines um, about three or so weeks ago. Now, those have all kind of reverted to the mean in terms of liquidity profiles. Uh, market depth um, is, you know, overall hasn't really changed um, in, and is and showing kind of signs of more kind of structural improvements um, in during kind of intermittent periods or during the week. But overall, you know, liquidity has continued to remain concerned bar that kind of spike during those headlines. Um, you know, again, no, no surprises here given summer conditions. And, and that's obviously turned off a lot of the, the retail flow that we most exchanges would typically see. Um, last thing to just mention um, in terms of some of those uh, or, or alts that we've, we've seen some activity on, you know, Filecoin, Uni, uh, Maker and so on. These the liquidity on these have improved a little bit. Um, you know that's been great to see. Um, most some of that we've seen skewed to the bid side. Um, I think that's been down to the market makers just generally um, offering better bids um, and not wanting to sit on the some inventory there and not showing us you know strong offers there. But we think that will improve over time as as maybe you know more momentum builds in the market. Maybe going into you know in, going into Q three Q four. Um, but yeah, that, that remains to be seen. And then last thing to mention um, on both liquidity and flows is, is optimism. Of course, they've had some, ha has had a, a, a jump in price over the last week or so or on the back of you know, what we've been seeing on, on um, the base uh, chain. Um, and that's led to, uh, and that's that jumped to a lead in, sorry, jump in price of about 10%, which has coincided nicely with a, with a scheduled token unlock where we've seen some kind of um, some, you know, scheduled selling um, there as well. Um, but uh, apart from that, back to you, Greg. Yeah, no, thank you, Trish. And uh, thanks for taking us through those retail buy ratios because, you know, we we sit on the institutional desk and we speak to institutions all the time. But I, I think uh, I sometimes forget how important retail is to this market. Um, you know, they're still often the ones driving price action. Uh, so it's very important to keep, a, keep an eye on what they're doing. Um, one question for you. As you speak to clients, I mean, what's the general sentiment? We've sort of been in this summer lull. Um, are folks, you know, just taking vacation and heading to the beach, or are they gearing up for a more volatile fall? Um, what, what are you hearing? You know, what one thing I've been really impressed about um, amongst institutional clients across all segments, and, and we're talking, you know, not only the crypto VCs and, and hedge funds, but also some of the traditional players is, um, you know, they they're all kind of um, certainly the crypto natives are, are marginally more active than, than some of the other segments. Um, no surprises there, given their, their loyalty to the space. Um, but some of the other folks, like let's say traditional hedge funds, uh, they've got their eyes on, on lots of other balls. Um, but having said that, they're all still, you know, have um, one eye at least on, on crypto. Um, and that's been great to see. They are very engaged with what's going on. They are reading the news and seeing the headlines. Um, and, 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 you know, having weekly conversations with, um, you know, the trading desk here at Coinbase. And that, that's been great to see. Whilst that may not currently materialize in any trading flow per se at this point in time, it, you can tell that there is some, you know, that there's continued growing interest. And I think that's also been cemented by, you know, obviously recent headlines, again, going back to you know, BlackRock ETF and so on. 
So I think, you know, um, net net, it's, it's a huge positive. Um, you know, there's no, um, I think there's no overall conviction um, at this point in terms of, you know, clients putting, you know, the money where their mouth is. Um, and, and that's no surprise. I think that's, you know, fair enough. Um, you know, we don't, we could see a move in, uh, you know, we have seen some de-risking recently, but I think, you know, there could be easily a, a move in, in either direction um, without any real conviction at this point. So I think that's, take, you know, allowed his clients to take a step back and um, with, with funds on the sideline. And I, I certainly see that, um, you know, as if and when perhaps, you know, um, an ETF is improved or there's any kind of um, exogenous factors that come into play, whether it's kind of, um, you know, uh, let's say regulation, for example, that can kind of, um, increase um, volatility in either direction. I think we may see some a pickup in activity, but um, for now it you know continues to be um, you know very strong in terms of engagement. Um, but I think there's still some some time and and um, um, opportunity still there for for institutional clients to to reengage. Great, yeah, that's that's great to hear that there's uh, you know still serious engagement, and I guess. That just means we should uh, enjoy this this quiet period because um, it may not last. <laughs> uh, thank you, Trish. Really appreciate uh, you taking us through those flows. Well, that's it for this week, folks. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We hope you learned something. We'll be back next Tuesday with another market update. Until then, uh, good luck trading. <laughs>